Deutsche Bank is down 30% year to date. Let's figure out how much this stock is worth. Now I'm gonna run through an example of how to value a bank. Deutsche Bank is a trillion euro company that has private banking, corporate banking, and investment banking services. Watch this video, watch the entire thing. I'm gonna walk you through how to value a bank, and in the end, I'm gonna check it for the critical assets that caused the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse. We're gonna smell check Deutsche Bank to see does it have the critical flaw that caused the failure of all these companies, or is it a diamond in the rough, and should you be buying the stock? You ready? Let's get to work. Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. I really appreciate you watching the channel and listening to the podcast. We are rational investors. We're methodical, cash flow seeking investors that pay reasonable prices for amazing stocks. This week up, we're going to continue in our banking series. We did Charles Schwab, we did JP Morgan Chase, which was a stud. Uh, and we're gonna now dive into Deutsche Bank. All these numbers are gonna be in euros. We're gonna figure out what this company does, what's its balance sheet, what's the quality of the balance sheet, and then we're gonna check it for the critical flaw that killed Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, which, by the way, I can't believe that Credit Suisse sold for a billion dollars to UBS. That was a $90 billion company not too long ago. Uh, absolute shame, I thought they stole that company and the bondholders got smoked on that deal. So. Let's dive through Deutsche Bank and figure out uh, how much money this company makes. Ready? Let's, uh, let's dive right into it. All right, the first thing we wanna do with any bank is we wanna look through the balance sheet. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because this isn't a refresh on balance sheets. You can see my balance sheet review on my channel. This is just me combing through Deutsche Bank's balance sheet. So total assets, $1.3 trillion, uh, basically up slightly from 1.32 trillion the prior year. You can see if I just scan this quickly, mostly cash, cash general central bank, uh, 178 billion euro. I might say dollars by the way occasionally, which is an accident. Everything I show you is in euros. Then the next big chunk here, financial assets um, at fair value through profit and loss. So this is your like held for secure, held for trading securities. And if you're in gap, these are all IFRS standards. So the terminology is going to be a little bit different, but this is basically stocks that they own, uh, that fluctuate in value and they take the change in value and book it to the income statement. So that's fair market value right there. You've got this one, uh, here, uh, loans and amortized costs. So this loan to amortized cost is kind of like the held to maturity securities that we saw in uh, Silicon Valley Bank or in Credit Suisse. It's this number 483 uh, million euro that we want to smell check. Uh, the rest of it is fairly small if I can say that because you're dealing with a 1.3 trillion dollar uh, asset balance sheet. Next largest one would be other assets which is like a, just a collection of everything else. Uh, for 118 uh, billion euro. Let's go through the balance sheet, really, excuse me, the liability section quickly. And then I wanna dive into those um, uh, loans and amortized costs and check them for credit losses. Uh, total liabilities, 1.26 trillion. So assets greater than liabilities, they got a positive book balance. We're gonna go through that calculation in a little bit, but I just wanna go through this. Uh, deposit 621 billion euro. That's basically obviously people depositing money in the bank itself. Uh, total financial liabilities at fair value. Again, fair value 388 billion euro. Uh, and they've got a positive equity balance. Okay, let's dive through the loans to amortize costs and figure out what kind of credit losses are they supporting. Now, if you look at the balance sheet, it says loans to amortize cost 483 billion euros and you can see there's notes here notes 18 19 20. these notes relate to pages prior and later on in the annual report please 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 every stock that you're interested in read the 10k or the annual report and then four big ticket items on the balance sheet on the income statement go read those footnotes that's what they're there for that's actually the meat of everything in the business is in the notes and very few people read them so let's go through 18 19 20. Note 18 breaks down all the components of the loan to amortize costs with a nice distribution here. They've got a, a lot of it, almost half of it in one particular item. I read this item, activity of households as employ, employers, undifferentiated cost and service produce activities 
of households for own use. I'm not sure what that says, frankly. So if anyone knows what that is, please throw that down in the comment below. Uh, but you've got about half the assets sitting in that bucket as a loan. Uh, the rest of it seems to be distributed among different industries. What I really wanted to get to was the allowance for credit losses. This is kind of like the uh, unrealized uh, gain, uh, gain or loss. If they were to market to market, how much loss would they take? Uh, and you can see the change year to year. Beginning of the year, 2022, they started the year with 4.8, 4.9 billion euros of unrecognized loss or credit loss on this portfolio. And that increased slightly 4.995 billion euro. So what we'll do is we'll look at their, uh, their uh, book value and judge that relative to this 5 billion, dollar, 5 billion euro uh, position for credit loss. And this is slightly different. This is an estimated loss. It's not a true mark to market like an unrealized gain or loss. Uh, this is a... Um, an accounting firm kind of stress testing is assessing their risks of the loan portfolio. If they had a mark to market metric, they would definitely use it because that's the best way to test value. But ultimately, they're estimating what they think the credit loss might be. It's not a real person. It's not a real market value. The next thing I thought was interesting is that there are restrictions on these assets. So of the 483 billion euros of these loans at amortized costs, 73 billion of that is actually restricted, meaning there's some sort of other pledge that they've made that they can't liquidate those if they had a, um, a, a if they got into a cash bind. And it actually goes a little further. They look at all their assets. They have a lot of restrictions on their assets. So of the uh, 1.3 trillion assets, 120 billion has been hypothecated or pledged to some other trade or some other entity, and they can't actually get their hands in that liquidity if they truly need it. So that's, that is a little flag for me. I thought that was kind of curious. I had not seen disclosures like that in other U.S. banks, um, but I thought I'd call that one out. Lastly, I just want to call the, they do state the definition of the financial assets at amortized cost. They t talk to you about the the policy, the 10K, and that they do recognize the, the change in market on these positions over time through an unrealized gain or loss and the accounting method behind it. Let's take a look at the comprehensive income section of the income statement, which lists all the unrealized gains or loss to check how big that number is. Ready? Let's do that. Okay, the last check we're going to do before we dive into a little bit more detail, and I apologize if, is the, if this video is running long, but it's critical that we try to understand these complex um, nuances to banks because ultimately if this fails, the bank fails. So we have to do this work because it's a security that we're going to own. We're equity owners. We're in the last position if anything were to go wrong. So let's do this work here. So we've got the comprehensive state, the statement of comprehensive income. It's going to begin with your net income and it's going to show kind of other other income that's even below the net income line. And what we're looking for is just your classified your um, classified profit or loss, your unrealized gain by different asset classes. They've got financial assets held at fair value. They've got derivatives. They've got assets classified held for sale. And they've got foreign currency translation as well as uh, equity method. None of these gain or losses are um, is sizable enough to bring down the book value all that much which I kind of like. So in the end, I think there's nothing that I can find readily that's looming over uh, Deutsche Bank, much like we saw from Silicon Valley Bank or from um, uh, Credit Suisse or even from Charles Schwab. Uh, these companies had much larger unrealized losses than it appears Deutsche Bank does on the initial set. So let's take a look at Deutsche Bank's income statement, figure out how they make their money, and then build a forecast. Let's take a look at where they derive their income. There are three segments to the income that are the primary drivers of their income. That would be corporate banking, uh, private banking, and investment banking. They have asset management and they've got some others, but the, the top three make up the vast majority of their income. So here are corporate banking. This is profit, 2.1 billion euro last year in their corporate banking. That's treasury services. That's basically, if you are a company and you're using Deutsche Bank as your checking and savings account, you're processing merchant processing through them, you're using uh, a line of credit for them or so forth, that is the treasury service. Then, And it's very profitable for companies to, or for banks, to have treasury services from corporations because corporations use a lot more services than, uh, say, an individual uh, with their checking account might use. For example, there's a very popular service in the U.S. called Positive Pay. 
Basically, every single check that the business writes goes to the bank first, and the bank will only clear checks from other people that they have in their system that says, hey, this check was written to this person for this amount. If those three violate, the person walking with a fake che check won't be cleared. That's called positive pay. It's a service that treasury departments use or offer treasury uh, corporate customers, and it's a value add. It's something you get to charge more for, and it's not something that you or I have on our, our, our individual checking account. So as a result, corporate banking is very profitable. Investment banking services. Now, investment banking is obviously the buying and selling of businesses. It's the raising of equity or raising of debt for businesses, mostly private, but lots of comp uh, lots of um, public companies as well. And that's hugely popular. It was very, very slow in the pandemic as everything froze. But as we're getting over the pandemic, uh, it's now coming back as companies are realizing maybe revenue is not where it used to be and they need to right size their balance sheet, they need to raise equity, they need to raise debt, they need to refinance the debt they have that they took on pre-COVID, interest rates are up there, they're moving and changing. So those changes create fees for investment bankers who take a fee off the capital that's raised. Private banking, that's individuals banking with Deutsche Bank, uh, and that's basically the, the interest spread between what they can uh, lend money out to and what they pay their customers. So it's kind of the weaker profit. But those three make up the lion's share. Asset management, you've got some others that round out round out the uh, profit section for Deutsche Bank. All right, let's dive into the income statement for Deutsche Bank and figure out how much profit they actually make. So the first thing you're going to do in any bank, you're going to look for the net interest income line. It's the difference between what they lend the money out for and the interest they receive on the money. So interest income, 25 billion euro, interest expense 10.6 billion, so they netted out 13.6, 13.7 billion euro in 2022 for the net interest income. It's very important. All banks have a spread between what they can borrow money for and what they lend money out. Now, a bank is an interesting entity because their product is cash, not like a manufacturing company that has a product they sell you and they get cash. The product of a bank is cash. So it's a little more difficult to figure out what cash is deposits and what cash is truly generated from operations. They call it out here. This is what they're making. And that, that's up from 11.15 billion the prior year and about f flat down slightly 11.5 uh, the prior year. 11.15 and then 11.5. Net interest income for credit losses, with the provision of credit losses, what they do is they take this money, the, the loans that they have, and say, how much of these loans could actually go bad? Well, they're saying, I've got to expense 1.2 billion because I think that might go, uh, I might lose that money. So I net out 12.4. Now it's very important. This 1.2 billion is an estimate. It is an estimate. It's not a fair market value. It is the accounting team and it's their auditors judging what they believe to be an estimate. And these can be wildly wrong, especially in wild times when interest rates are really, really moving. Right? That's if you read Silicon Valley Bank's uh, 10K right before they went under. They were talking about how profitable they are, how the, the net interest spread had widened, and how much money they made. There was no um, a pretense for what was going to come. So always want to be very careful that uh, you know, run-on banks are serious and it can really damage the, the entity. They've got other income here from like uh, trading and investment banking and so forth, 13.5. Then they've got their cost, you know, general admin, commissions, impairment, restructuring, so forth, 20 billion. So they net out. 5.59 or 5.6 billion euro last year in profit. Prior to that was 3.39 billion. Prior to that was 1 billion. So in 2020, they went from 1 billion to 3.4 billion to 5.6 billion dollars. That's a huge increase in profit. And it's driven mainly by investment banking fees are up and also the net interest spread as it widens. That's at least the theory of why banks should make more money in the uh, rising interest rate environment, they can lend money out at higher rates than they pay, than they receive or they, they, excuse me, that they pay. But the problem with that is that the high interest rates, the, the, the speed at which the interest rates have moved higher, it's causing a problem in their assets of loan portfolio. It's causing those loan portfolios to fall in value and sometimes that fall erases all book value. All right, now we've looked at Deutsche Bank's balance sheet income statement, 
provision for credit losses, unrealized gains. We looked at the definition of um, you know uh, loans held held at amortized cost. We've kind of gone through the smelter, and we don't see any materially large numbers that are looming, looming out there. Let's take a look at history now of Deutsche Bank and go back nine years and see what's book value. How has it been growing or shrinking? Where is it? What's net income? What are the margins? And kind of get an idea of over time, how has this business performed? So behind me, I've got their total assets from 2014 to 2022. And the gist here is their assets are down 3% on average over this nine year period of time. They started this period of time with 1.7 trillion euros in 2014. And that's come down to 1.6, 1.59, 1.47, 1.35, 1.29, 1 kind of bottoming in 2019. Then it comes up mildly to 1.32, 1.32, 1 1.33 trillion euro. The last three years, assets have been essentially flat. If I look at goodwill and total liabilities, kind of the same thing, declining, declining slightly faster than total assets, which is nice. So you would expect the book value then to be growing. And sure enough, if I take total assets, minus goodwill and intangibles, minus total liabilities, I get the book value 58 billion euros. And that's going to grow as the assets, excuse me, as the, as the liabilities shrink faster than the assets. So 58 billion, 57, 55, then to 59, 55, then to 61 and 65 billion euro last year in 2022. So this business is kind of up, it's down very much more volatile than say a JP Morgan that's kind of on a smooth glide path that we discussed before. This business definitely has some rockiness to it. I would expect a bigger discount on book value for that rockiness for this business. But overall, you can see earlier in the time period, it had negative growth rates annually. Later in the decade, through the last three years, it has grown remarkably. On a book value per share basis, you're basically looking at $28 to $30 book value per share right now for the stock. Market cap last uh, fiscal year is 22 billion euro. It's been as high uh, as say 30 billion uh, in 2015, 2016. And then what I want to really want to talk about is the price to book. So if I look at market cap divide by book value, price to book, this thing is sitting at an right now 0.3 or at least last fiscal year 0.3 times book value. So you're buying it less than the price of book value. In theory, someone takes over Deutsche Bank, uh, cancels all debt liability, and then takes the remaining cash, they would make money that's less than book value. And it seems like it's traded less than book value for this entire history that I have. In 2014, it was half the book value, 0.5. Uh, it's been 0.5 consistently. Last couple years through the pandemic, it got down to 0.2 and 0.3 times book value. Very, very cheap in my in my humble opinion for this for this business. But it also has some rockiness to it. It's a lot. It's its assets are shrinking. Uh, it's growing book value only because liabilities are shrinking faster than assets. So it, it definitely has um, issues, and I and and that's why it's got a lower multiple. If you recall, like a J.P. Morgan. Uh, the gold standards may be trading one and a half times book value. So these things don't trade at multiples like 10, 15, 20 times. This is not times earnings. This is times book value. And banks should be about one uh, with the premium banks above one, the less than premium banks below one. Okay, so we covered book value. Let's figure out how much net income and margin this business makes. So revenue over time, right? We looked at a point in time in 2022 last time, but over time, what has happened to this business? Well, over 20, since 2014 to 2022, business revenue, top line revenue has declined on average 2.1% annually from 30 billion euro in uh, 2014 to 32 as a high, then 28, 25, 24, 22, 22, 24, and 26. So the last three years, it's gone up, like we said early, when we focus just in that uh, one annual report that we saw. But when you zoom out, and if we're long-term investors, if you're buying the stock, you're holding it for at least a decade. Don't even talk to me if you buy the stock and you're not holding it for longer than 10 years. But when you zoom out, 
you see this stock was a lot bigger than it used to be and it's been declining until recently it's turned up. Is that a turnaround? I don't know. Is it a blip before further down? I don't know. That's, uh, you know, that's uh, part of the guessing game of investing, I guess. Net income. So when they made 30 billion euro, did they make any money? Well, they made 1.6 billion. Good job. The next year, however, they made 32 billion euro and they lost 6.7, 6.8 billion euro. They lost money the following year, 1.4 billion. They lost money the following year after that, 750 million euro. They finally squeaked a profit of quarter million euro, quarter billion euro only. Two, that's 226 million euro. That's it on revenue of 24 billion. Uh, that is teeny tiny. It's basically break even. And the following year, they lose another 5.3 billion. So if I call that the break even, that means they've lost money. Uh, call that five out of the last nine years, more than 50% of the time we are looking at, they've lost money. Now their track record, uh, the last three years is stellar. I mean, stellar. They made 500 euro last year, then they made 2.3, then they made 5.5 billion euro. Like that record is huge. Is that because the uh, credit quality assets have gone up like they claim? Is it because the credit spreads have widened and the bank could finally make money? Might be. I don't know. It's very difficult to tell, uh, certainly in this track record. If I look at shares outstanding, how do they fund the losses? Well, they fund the losses by printing shares. They went from 1.2 million, excuse me, 1.2 billion shares to 2.1 billion shares. So shares, they're not buying the back. Earnings have been all over the place because they lost money five out of the last nine years. So it's very difficult to look at earnings per share. If I look recently, the last couple years, 0.23 euros, 1.1 euro, 2.6 euro. So what do you do with this? How are you supposed to judge what the what the run rate is? Do you, do you take a 2.6 and you just assume a growth rate off the new high? Do you pick this low to be super conservative because this could be pandemic driven? What we're going to do is we're going to average these three. I'm going to average those things. I'm going to take them out and say that, some, that they got to be in some ballpark there out 10 years is the best guess we can do. As for yield, Earnings yields are all over the place. Uh, they've been largely negative because the last five years, the company has been, uh, the last five of the, of, of the nine, the company has been negative. So it's hard to even pin down a yield. But we're gonna try to forecast this business and see if it's a good buy or not. Ready? Let's do that now. Okay, so we're gonna pick up with the earnings per share. Now I'm using a um, $1.33 euro uh, per share as my estimate and basically growing that at 1.4%. So I'm taking the average of the last three years, I grow it at 1.4%. 1.4% is what they grew their book value on average over the last nine years. So I'm gonna take that growth rate, 1.4%, I'm gonna apply it to the average of the last three earnings per share and say over the next decade, they need to make on average at, uh, at, at one euro 30, 40 cents in that ballpark and end about one euro 50 cent uh, in 10 years from now. If I apply a 10% yield to that, which is a high yield, um, I get $14 and I get four, if I apply a 10% yield to that, I get 14 euro 88 cents uh, for a future price target for Deutsche Bank. Now we're gonna take the same logic and apply it to book value. We saw that their book value was growing over this time because assets were decreasing faster than liabilities. They were able to squeak out of growth. We're gonna assume that that continues or that the new trend of profitability continues and hopefully their book value naturally grows because their assets are growing with profitability. But either way, we need 1.4% growth annually on their book value to make this forecast work. And that turned the book value into 75 billion euro out 10 years from now. If I apply a price to book target of 0.4, I get a price target of 14 euros. It's interesting here to note that if I put this as a one and just say in 10 years from now, this is back behind us, Deutsche Bank is, is, is back up on kind of the par with the rest of the banks, that means it's a 35, 35 euro stock. But right now, I have no evidence for that, and that's far too risky to bake into my assumptions. I'm gonna say that they're gonna to continue to be underperforming the book value, 0. 
and I'm gonna give it a 14 euro priced handle with a possible upside in the future if they can continue turning the business around. Okay, so now that we have an opinion on the stock, we've got a net income price target methodology, 1488. I've got a book value methodology, 1404, very close to one another. And I'm gonna say it's 1446 is the price target out 10 years ago as an estimate, right? This is not financial advice. This is my channel, my analysis, just my opinion. Seek professional help if you're buying securities. But this is a way, this is how methodology, this is how forecasts are built by Wall Street analysts. Why can't we learn to do it? So here we go, we're learning how to do it. So what can I buy the stock for today? Well, I can buy as much share of the stock as I want at nine euro a share. I think out long term, it's gonna be 14 and change. If I drop this into an IRR model, what do I get? Well, I, I get a, a fractional ownership of a business. That's what we're buying when you buy equity. You're not trading this. It's not a, a price on a screen someplace. If you're drawing lines to figure out where that thing's going, just stop. Put your money in a CD and go away. What we're trying to do is understand if you bought this stock, you own a business. And if you are a customer at Deutsche Bank, you know the people there, you work with the company, you're in uh, Europe and you use the services, or in the US and you use the service, but, but you have a affiliation with the business where it's, it's more than just a price on a screen. Um, that's what you're buying. You're buying ownership into that. If you if you walk into their bank, you see a piece of trash on the ground, you pick it up and throw it away because you own a piece of that business. That's how you want to think about it. And in that instance, this is your pro rata ownership over that period of time that you can lay claim to. It's part of your investment thesis. You bought this stream of cash flow, granted its income, its net income per share that they could pay out as a dividend, they could use to buy back shares, or they can go out and acquire other banks, but it's your pro rata share. You bought that for nine euro, you're gonna sell it for 14, you get this net stream of cash flow, and that is a 22% IRR on a stock in this market because the price is tanked so badly. Uh, let's put this in a distribution curve because who knows what happens when A, I get this video released, and then B, you could be watching this a week later and the price is completely changed, so who knows. But Behind me is a forecast. Behind me is just math. It is not a promise of the future. It's simply a math case that I showed you how I arrived at the assumptions. And you can go build your, you go build your own case or you can go to my website, link below. If you want this model, you can value any bank you want. So nine euro is the current price. If that price goes up, still interested because it's still a 15% IRR case if this math behind me pans out at 12 euro per share, uh, still very attractive. If the stock collapses even further, it gets even, even better. And again, if long term, long term, uh, Deutsche Bank is able to fix their book value per share and they get a little bit more of a premium because maybe, I don't know, lots of other banks in Europe collapse, these guys are around, shining star, last one, everyone runs to it. Like, that could happen. And in that case, with that premium, the stock price is gonna go way up. So I think the upside here could actually be higher than what I have behind me. The question is the downside, and that is hard, hard to tell. Um, when I go through the income statement, balance sheet, uh, and, and, and assets, I don't see anything. We saw their book value is what, 60 billion euro? Uh, the unrealized loss that we saw was 5.5 billion. So that's what 10% of book value, that's nothing, it's no big deal. They can weather that kind of storm. So I don't see a red flag, but nevertheless, I'm in the States. I'm not in Europe. I don't have some context out there and I'm not the biggest, um, uh, I, I, I have not studied IFRS, the International Standards of Financial Reporting that uh, are standards that uh, that is used in Europe as much. Now, I use GAAP here, the Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, which is similar. They're both similar uh, professional standards of accounting, but there are nuances between the two. So that said, I don't see any particular red flags here, but I want to caution you that this market is wild and there's all kinds of things that could pop up um, in Deutsche Bank that could affect the company. But right now, from what from what I can see, I like the stock. I'm gonna give it a good. I think there's plenty upside here. They got three years of decent earnings. If they can keep that up, 
They don't need much of a growth rate to really affect the stock. And if they get any kind of premium assigned to the book value again, the stock price is really gonna, gonna go up. So barring any kind of meltdown and collapse, I think here the tide is going out. It's thrown out stocks like this one that might be very interesting. Again, if you wanna own a bank, I suggest you, you're in Europe, you know the landscape better than me uh, broadcasting from, uh, from the States. Uh, this is my review of Deutsche Bank. I promised you the, uh, that we would check this stock for the key uh, factors that brought down Credit Suisse and that brought down Silicon Valley Bank. We've done that. If you want to see more videos like this, check out my JP Morgan video or check out my Charles Schwab video. Both very good cases of U.S. companies. One really good, one uh, kind of rocky, actually, surprisingly. So take a look at those. Also, throw me a comment down below. Let me know what other stocks you'd like to see. I'm happy to take recommendations. And check out my website. I teach a course on finance, how to, how to read stocks. I am a CFO by profession. That's my job. This is a hobby of mine. But I teach a course because I want to teach people how to invest for themselves, get a little financial independence. So check out the website, cashflowinvestingpro.com. You can also join the Cashflow Club. Uh, we have five analysts in the club. We release stocks every week that we think are interesting, that are, that are true cash monsters, cash machines. And if you're looking to, to find some um, very unique off the radar companies that are yielding high cash with low debt and growing revenue and earnings, check out the Cashflow Club. Lastly, if you like this model, you can buy the model for banks on my website. Thank you very much for the time. I greatly appreciate all the comments and subscribers. Thank you so much. I hope you really enjoyed this video. It was fun to record Deutsche Bank. I had not looked at the stock before, and I apologize if I'm rusty on the International Financial Reporting Standards, the IFRS. Uh, it's not my native accounting language, uh, so it's a little, a little tweaking there occasionally on the language. But uh, my name is Cameron Stewart. Uh, CFA. This is Rational Investing, where we hunt for true value of stocks. And uh, I really hope you liked uh, this presentation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.